Chasing the Rainbows with your host, Bernice Quisenberry. On this week's episode of Cry It Out Loud, it is called Forever Missing, and we are discussing the second stage of the grief process called yearning and searching. Last week, we discussed the first stage, shock and numbness, and in the following weeks to come, we will be discussing the third phase, which is disorganization and despair, and the fourth phase, which is reorganization and recovery. Just a reminder, grief is an extremely personal experience, and our goal here is to let all fellow survivors out there listening to know however you feel or whatever you are going through, you are not alone. And that's why we are sharing our own personal experiences, what happened, what we felt, all of that, um, just to let everyone know out there we are an open, safe space for you survivors. I'm just going to jump right in. I'm flying solo this week, and... When I start to talk about this, um, it's sometimes hard to put into words what exactly we are feeling and, and, and it makes sense, right? Because when we're going through it and trying to describe it to someone who's never been there is really difficult. Um, so I'm grateful that hopefully other survivors are tuning in and you'll be able to relate or find something here, um, that you know that you are not alone. So when the numbness began to wear off for me, um, I believe it was about two months in, I want to say, when that happened, I started to feel very empty inside and there was this, this void that nothing could fill. And I began pretty immediately to start to search for answers. And it was answers around the death of our daughter. It was answers around her delivery, around my pregnancy, around any pre-existing health conditions that I've had. But I just felt like I had so much unresolved clutter going on in my head that I couldn't make sense of it all without getting these answers. And during the stage... Not only did I want these answers, but I also wanted someone to blame for it. And I had all of these immense feelings of anxiousness, guilt, and jealousy of others that was all flooding in all at the same time too, along with all the obsession that I had going on around the events that occurred. So what my husband and I did was we sought these answers and we went to medical professionals specifically our care team um, of maternal fetal medicine doctors. And when we went there, I had probably two pages of questions that I needed answered. And because, you know, I'm not a medical professional, so I had no idea um, where some things that would seem safe or normal during pregnancy or signs um, that could have maybe been prevented. And it's not just that I wanted these answers to um, look at them and and have clarity or anything like that. But it was also, too, I wanted to have these answers um Because it was. It was like, where do I place this blame that I'm feeling? Do I place it on myself? Do I place it on my power for doing this? Or do I question it? Um, You know, or do I place it on, you know, our medical team? Because, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, mistakes happen because people are human. But it was just like I needed, I felt like I just needed to have these answers. And so, you know, I searched all aspects then too. And, and when I said that, you know, I was placing blame in all these areas, well, when your world gets flipped upside down and all of this happens and you have all these questions, you're feeling all of these emotions, it's really hard to not question all aspects that you believe in in your life, right? Around mental, mental, physical, emotional, spiritually, all of those things. You know, all of the beliefs that I've ever had or have come to create, you know, in my adult lifetime, um, I just felt like nothing was taken off the table at that point. Like I needed to look at everything and evaluate it. And one of the biggest things was for me was what do I believe in when, um, you know, when our baby passes, where did Brooke go? What happened? Those kind of things. And I think it really questioned my faith at that time. Um, but my whole, you know, our whole world gets flipped upside down just around all of the traumatic events of this. And it's hard to not question this, right? And I kept wanting to search for these answers for 
why our baby is no longer here and why. Like, I just wanted to know why and how and and all of that. Um, This was an extremely exhausting place to be at for me during this phase. It was um, receiving clear answers were very important and all of that. But also, there was going to be questions that were going to be left unanswered. And we were never always going to get, you know, we were never going to get the clarity that we wanted, 100% fact that this is why or how this happened. But, you know, I think we went at this the best way that I felt the most comfortable, my husband felt the most comfortable for us, because we were trying to educate ourselves. And especially if, you know, later down the road, we wanted to try for more children. I think it was important for us to know, okay, was this something we could have prevented? Or is this something that, um, you know, we needed to look at at a deeper scope of things. Did we need to involve specialists, those kind of things? Um, or was it just unfortunately that it just happened and there was nothing that we could have done, anyone could have done? Um, and that's where we got, came to the conclusion of. So, you know, it's difficult to explain searching to someone. And I know I mentioned this at the beginning, and especially for someone who has never gone through this phase. And I felt like I was seeking out, like, anything that reminded me of Brooke Hurt, like, sounds, little cues, little smells, um, people that, you know, got to know her in the NICU, those kind of things, doctors, nurses, and then the places that reminded me of her, like, when I was pregnant um, and different happy times that I got to connect with Brooke and knew her while she was alive. But it was all around that. And for me... I, it was like a double-edged sword, right? Because I wanted these things for comfort, but then it was also extremely emotional um, going for those items as well. And, you know, I would hold on to her blanket. I would hold on to different things that she had because it did, but then like that smell faded, you know, eventually, you know, her blanket got dirty. We would have to consider washing. It was all that stuff. So it was really hard letting go of those things then too. But um, sometimes um, for like one split second, I would get so close um, to feeling like I completely beaded that void. Like all of a sudden, I forgot that she passed. And really, when that happened for me, it was when I was sleeping. And then, you know, when I woke up, um, you know, reality then sat back in for me, realizing that my baby was gone. And it's like you know, I would have these dreams that I was rocking her, um, you know, that I was nursing her, that I was holding her, comforting her. And then only to wake up to realizing that I had an empty bassinet beside me and an empty nursery. And it was just, and all I had was my little comfort cub that I had um, beside me with her blanket wrapped around her. And this phase was really grueling. and, And it really felt like at certain points, almost like it was tormenting. The feelings um, that I got from this uh, were, it was a very unfulfilled searching that I was going through. And it just kept bringing up these repetitive feelings of loss, hopelessness, despair. Um, Like, you know, what did the future hold? And you know, during this time, like I said, I was questioning everything in our life because everything just seems so uncertain from the events that we just went through. Um, because over and over again, we're reminded um, that, you know, no, no smell, no sound, no dream, no anything will ever be able to bring our baby back to us physically. And I think that was one of the hardest things in this phase was the harsh reality that nothing we could do would ever bring our daughter back. And, you know, I, so to talk about the yearning a little bit, I yearned for what I planned for, what I envisioned and what I saw and dreamt for with our baby. And I knew Brooke passed, okay, not like I wasn't um, in this disillusional state. I knew she died, but I longed and yearned for her return to fill just this, this horrible emptiness and void that I was feeling that was created from her not being here physically with us. And many emotions I experienced and expressed during this time. And 
a lot of it was I was finally getting out the crying and the sobbing, the weeping, the anger, the anxiety, all of it just finally was coming out of me. And it was like, I could not hold it back. And, you know, this was a little after, you know, I was already back to normal society, was already back to the workforce, was already, you know, trying to go out in public and those kind of things. And when this came on, it just hit me like a ton of bricks and there was nothing I could do to control it. And honestly, I almost feel like, you know, death brings out um, the beautiful part of our society to see like our supports who really step up and people who are there for us. But then it also brings out the ugliness with the judgmentalness and and things people say with great intentions, but don't mean to. But also, you know, the stares and the looks that you get in public. And, and I'll get into this in a little bit. But, you know, I hope um, from my experience and moving forward with my life, um, something that I learned from this was when I see someone doing that, um, you know, just to offer, you know, is there anything I can do to help? Um, and if there's not okay, like there's no need to sit there and stare at somebody or give them a look or those kind of things because you don't know what somebody else is going through. Um, but, you know, just to be a kind ear and to be there for someone in the moment that they might need somebody the most. And, you know, like I mentioned in the beginning, like this was an extremely exhausting phase from all of that, right? Because we're trying to hold it together. We're trying to return to society. And then also, you know, being out in public, there's a lot of triggers. And there's that jealousy that I spoke about at the beginning. Like I was, um, and I went through this where I was jealous of others. And it's not like I wished ill on anybody else or anything like that. But I had to stay off social medias for a while. And it was because looking at other pregnant women, because, you know, friends around my age are having babies. We're all in that age. Um, and so, like, seeing others pregnant, seeing others having babies, seeing others that are bringing home their baby from the NICU. Um, and like I said, it was just like I was jealous of them. And I could not explain it. And then seeing the videos, um, you know, or pictures and things like that, hearing the babies crying, seeing them doing their cooing, just seeing all of that, it was extremely difficult, especially a baby girl for me, um, especially with a baby that was around Brooke's age. It really did hit me hard because I just wanted so badly for that to be Brooke with us. And, you know, that was what we were hoping for. But some other uh, emotions that like really happened and feelings that occurred was confusion and preoccupation. And what I mean by that is I was in such a state where I had a lot going on in my mind around dealing with the traumatic events that we experienced, dealing with all of these emotions during this phase, and then dealing with all of the thoughts and questions and needing answers and all of that, while, like I said, trying to put one foot in the front of the other in society, trying to hold it together. But my mind was so elsewhere that I had such a foggy brain with it, a grief brain or whatever you want to call it. And um, it was really hard to process anything else or to really be fully engaged or listening to anything else outside of my own grief that I had going on or my own loss. Um, so, you know, during that time, I was not the best, um, you know, employee, the best, like a best friend to somebody or the best sister and things like that because of all these feelings. And then it just adds on to that guilt, that remorse, because then you feel guilty for not doing enough as a partner or as, you know, whatever. And it just adds to all of that. So it's just exhausting. And even sitting here thinking about it, I'm exhausted. Um, so, you know, for me to be able to return during this to – the outside world, I had to carry around a comfort cup and it was a weighted bear. And carrying that around, it was because my arms ached physically during this phase where I missed holding my, my infant daughter. And, you know, studies have shown that it happens with, you know, any baby loss and things like that, where like, we just want that, that, comfort of holding and cuddling and and just like you know getting that with our baby because our arms are empty 
And, you know, I would also then, too, sleep with the comfort cub. I would sleep with her blanket wrapped around her. I also, in the mornings, um, especially earlier in this phase, I would get the cuddle cub dressed. I would change the cuddle cub's diaper. I would do things that a mother would do. Now, looking back, I'm almost like feeling silly for even sharing this, but I know survivors out there can feel for this. And, um, you know, for me, it was just like I needed to do those things. And I needed to make sure that I was feeling that sense of and filling that void. And it was with my cuddle cub. And that's okay. You know, that's what I needed at that time. And I'm just realizing that now sharing with everyone out there. But also, I took my cuddle cub, like I said, out in public with me. And the amount of stares and comments that I got from people, one, they were either very embracing and and sweet and kind. But then others were, you know, what's wrong with that woman? Is she mentally ill? Does she have, you know, dementia, Alzheimer's, you know, because that's what people are used to seeing. And it's really sad that that's the society we're living in. And honestly, depending on what kind of thing I was going through that day or whatever emotion or feeling I was having, I could not either stand up for myself, like say, you know, it's because I lost my daughter. Um, I would just, you know, walk away and not listen and just like tune it out. And that's fine too. But then like some days I could, but then some days, you know, people would catch me when I was being a little spicy because I was a little angry at the world because of what just happened to us and our daughter. So, you know, I would say, well, this is because our daughter died in my arms and because my arms ache for my daughter and those kind of things. And then people would feel really bad. And that was not what my intention was. It was more like, you know, not to feel bad, but treat people with compassion and empathy. It doesn't matter, you know, what somebody is doing or or like, why does that even bother you that I was carrying around a cuddle cub, really? Um, and now, like, it has me look at things a lot differently because grief, we can't explain why we feel comfort or seek comfort in different things. We just do. And so, you know, that was me. Um, I also developed what they call a psychological connection with Brooke. And um, this took some time and development, like, during this phase for me. And you know, what I mean by this is, is like, okay, I can't physically carry Brooke with me. I'm not going to physically watch Brooke grow up. I'm not going to physically make memories with Brooke anymore. So how can I stay connected to her? Because the world does not stop evolving, right? Like we, um, even though our world stopped and got completely disrupted and shattered from under us, the, the world continues to move. So how can I continue, even though our life is continuing and the world's continuing, how can I remain connected to her and in our own special way? So, you know, this really helped me um, during this phase to, to find this connection and bond to our baby girl. So there was a couple things that I, I decided to do and my husband did too. And I think it was really hard for us to get to this point where we decided this is what we were going to do to honor our daughter because I felt like it was almost final then. So I had to like really work through all of those feelings, process it, and I didn't do it alone. I did it with other survivors. I also did it with my trauma therapist. I did it with my husband, talking through it because that was the only way that I was going to make it through and decide what I was actually going to do because it was so overwhelming to pick. There's so much out there that we can do, how we can honor her, um, that, you know, I wanted to make sure that it was something that was special to us. And it also signified how, how our relationship was right. And very personally. So there was two big things for me. I first, um, for mother's day, the first mother's day that I had without her I spoke to my husband and I finally came up with wanting a footprint necklace and you can get them and they take the picture or the imprint of her footprints and they put it onto a necklace. And so it's engraved on there. And then you can have something on, written on the back, which is what the holdup was for me. Because it was one, deciding on what type of necklace am I going to get. Two, what was I going to have as the re engraving. And then thirdly, am I going to get any additions added to it, like her birthstone or a forever heart, you know, those kind of things. And it was just a lot to process and work through. And so, um, you know, 
it was a delayed process for us because I did obsess about it a lot. But like I said, had a big support system behind me to help me to decide. And now I love the necklace and I don't take it off and I have been wearing it ever since. And then also this one took a little longer for me to decide, but I started to draft it up because it gave me something to look forward to during this phase on how I was going to connect with my daughter. And I knew I wanted to get a tattoo of something related to her. And so not a big needle person. Um, Actually, needles scare me um, getting injected or anything like that. Thinking about a foreign object going into a vein just freaks me out. Um, Really bad with shots. But but I was like, you know, I just really want something that's going to be symbolic and, and meaningful to me. And so I got a full sleeve tattoo, surprising. And it started out being her birth flowers that I got down my arm. And then in Roman numerals, it has her birth date and then her death date on my pulse. And I did that because Latin is a dead language. And it, I just love the way that um, the Latin Roman numerals, you know, the, the numbers look there. Um, And it was very fitting because I got a black and white tattoo with my skin showing through. So it's a very delicate and airy tattoo. But then it started out as that. And then I got added in there um, our older son's birth flowers. And then our youngest daughter, I added in her birth flowers as well. So it became one of our children's um, full sleeve. But it gives me the opportunity to talk now about her. So when people look at my tattoo or they mention something about it, Whatever the case may be, it gives me the opportunity to talk about why. And for me too, you know, she's always going to be by my side. And then I have a cardinal on my shoulder, which is very symbolic for our family and birds in general with, um, and cardinals, you know, with death and um, have that sitting on my shoulder with a branch that leads down into the flowers. And so the whole thought process behind it was, yes, I had this opportunity to talk about our one missing um, piece physically here on earth with us. And so that's that. And then I got her um, footprints on my left, um, right at my left wrist. And that's over my pulse as well. My watch pretty much covers that up. But it's just something intimate between me and her. And it's her feet prints. And it just means so much to have you know, this, because I'm reminded, not that I would ever forget about her, but I'm reminded of her all the time. And then I get the opportunity, like I said, to keep talking about her, to keep her legacy alive and to keep her alive by doing that. So that was my sense of connection. Like I said, very personal to each and every person, but that's what worked for me um, during this. And honestly, it gave me an opportunity, like I said, to start researching, to start figuring out how or why we, you know, wanted to be able to do this. But during my emotional phases, it was very, very difficult, you know, during this grief phase. Um, Gosh, I think they all are. And every time reliving them and talking about them, it just brings me right back there. And, you know, this is a constant, forever going, you know, process that we live in. And, you know, I still feel these, these emotions. I still feel these questions that arise. Even years later now, I still have questions that I need answers to. And, you know, I seek out those answers because it's things that I didn't think about or, you know, and, and it's not because, like I said, it's more for this processing and for me to feel like, okay, I have exhausted this. I feel better about it. And that's what it's about because it is our own grief And these are things that we need to do to keep going, right? So we are only given one life. And after going through these traumatic events, we have to do whatever we need to do to get that peace of mind with everything around this. With that said, listeners, I believe that is everything that I have to share around this. I hope you found some comfort in what I discussed today. Please know that we are always with you, fertility loss, pregnancy loss, and baby loss survivors. Until next week, please tune in next Wednesday for our next episode. Take care.